we are now rediscovering that which our ancestors long ago knew, that mushrooms are deep reservoirs for very powerful medicines. In the next 10 minutes, I'm going to describe four mushrooms which I think are essential for human health. The first mushroom I want to mention is Amadou. Amadou was described by Hippocrates in 450 BC as an anti-inflammatory. Well, Amadou is a birch polypore, but it has other attributes as well. You can hollow this mushroom out in the center, put embers of a fire inside, and keep fire alive for days. Moreover, if you boil this mushroom, it delaminates into a cellular fabric. And my hat is made from Amadou. Now, another fungal friend I have here, which I want to unveil, is Agaricon. Agaricon is the longest living mushroom in the world. It was described by Dioscorides in 65 AD as Elixirium ad longum vitum, the treatment against consumption. Now, this mushroom is a resident of the old growth forest. It is now thought to be extinct in Europe. It grows in Northern California, Oregon, Washington, and British Columbia. This mushroom survives in the old growth forest under extremely adverse conditions, hundreds of inches of rain per year, wind, sleet, hail, baking in the sun, and yet is the longest living mushroom that we know today. And may have the clicker. Thank you, Mark. So my partner and wife uh, spent a lot of time in the old growth forest looking for these mushrooms. And to give you some idea how rare agaricon is, although we have 40 strains of agaricon in culture after 30 years, the largest library by far in the world, my dear professor, Dr. Michael Bew, discovered his first agaricon in the old growth forest just these past few weeks after looking for mushrooms in the old growth forest for more than 40 years. So agaricon has anti-tubercular properties, and we have now confirmed this working with the U.S. BioShield Biodefense Program under the guidance of NIH and U.S. AMRID. And sometimes we have to go to great extremes to find these mushrooms. This is a 700-year-old Douglas fir tree. Our team member ascends the tree. We go 100 feet up this tree, and this is the oldest agaricon that we have found so far, approaching 100 years in age. Now, how is it that this mushroom can survive under microbial attack? And it's able to do so because the mycelium is this cellular architecture that is based on a network concept. And we don't need to harvest the mushrooms. We get a small piece of tissue. And the mycelium, as it grows, utilizes what we know as epigenesis. It has the amazing ability to adapt uh, its host defense strategies against pathogens. And using this information, we've been able to develop some very powerful gateways to new medicines. And these are extracellular droplets that we wash from the mycelium. And I'm happy to announce that we have discovered a new class of antimicrobials and antivirals called Fomitopsterols, after the Latin name of this mushroom, which is Fomitopsis officinalis. So powerful are these antivirals that when we do 100 to 1 dilution, we are more powerful than ribavirin against flu viruses and herpes. Um, now, mushrooms have other properties which are interesting. And so this is a group of cordyceps mushrooms. They're known as entomopathogenic fungi, fungi that kill insects. And the insects are on a constant dire dance between dinner and death as they go through soils. And cordyceps is a source of cyclosporin. Moreover, just recently, the FDA approved Novartis for a new anti-MS drug called Gilenia, which is predicted to be one of the 10 most profitable commercially produced drugs in the history of medicine. But cordyceps has a different face. And the cordyceps is a mold, has a mold stage. And they're like two faces of, of the same organism. Uh, these spores are very infectious to these insects. And most insects have entomopathogenic fungi that can harm them. So they avoid them with great diligence. But I did something different. I took these cultures of the mold state and I morphed it in the laboratory into a pre-sporulating form. And so insects avoid these spores. But I discovered that if you took the mycelium without the spores, something else happened, which was truly amazing they became super attractants. And they became super attractants to ants, to termites, and a surprising array of other types of insects. And so the insects, in this case, an ant becomes mummified, and then boing, <laughs> a cordyceps mushroom sprouts out of its head. So it goes full circle. 
Now, we did extracts, again, washing the mycelium, and we were able to find that termites would stream directly to the location where the extracts were placed, and the three positive controls, and the termites would tunnel specifically to where that location was. Well, I started trying against other non-social insects, uh, flies, gnats, and mosquitoes. And this is the baseline, the flat graph there is the control, and the only difference is we added the mycelium uh, to the extract. And we have not just attractants, but I've discovered super attractants. So when I tried it against mosquitoes, and this is where we hit the big home run, we can attract mosquitoes roughly equivalent to a human hand with the extracts. This has profound implications for disease control, from malaria to yellow fever to West Nile virus. And so what can we do? There's lots that we can do. I think we can now control disease vectors, zoonotic diseases carried by insects across landscapes. And since so many uh, insects and arthropods vector diseases, most of you may not know that H5N1 bird flu is carried by house flies. This is something that's not widely reported. But because of climate change, subtropical diseases are now entering into temperate zones. So being able to control zoonotic pathogens, I think, is one avenue that will have a positive impact in helping habitats and humans dwelling within those habitats. Moreover, insects and arthropods not only transmit diseases that afflict humans, but plants. So the implications of this, I think, is absolutely enormous. So we can increase the the efficiency of bug zappers. We can, uh, uh, we can uh, steer insect migrations across landscapes. This is a paradigm shifting, revolutionary breakthrough on the most fundamental of levels. Um, and moreover, we can attract uh, disease carrying bugs um, and blend them with expired antiviral drugs, antimicrobial drugs, or the crude precursors that made those drugs. And we can create a panoply of a mixture of these drugs so the disease resistance would not occur. We can distract the, the, the insects uh, away from human populations, away from animal populations, away from plant populations. Or we can bring them to a locus and be able to control them. And most of you have heard that the mosquito population on the East Coast was 10 times greater this year than it was previously. So another mushroom um, empowers the immune system. And this is turkey tails. And turkey tail mushrooms have also been used for more than 1,000 years. Uh, NIH funded our group with a $2.1 million breast cancer clinical study, which has been recently completed. Now, this breast cancer clinical study uh, was dealing with a non-ER, non-estrogen responsive breast cancer patients, ladies. Um, and the study has come back with some remarkable results. And when you if patients have radiation therapy or, or chemotherapy, their immune system is oftentimes impaired, so natural killer cells are decreased. Uh, taking these mushrooms as an adjunct therapy, not as a substitution, but to support the immune system, the natural killer cells uh, increase on a dose-dependent basis. The red bar is no treatment uh, with three grams and six grams per day. Um, and then post-radiation, the immune system is depressed, and then on a dose-dependent basis, the natural killer cells are enhanced over a period of four weeks. So this raises base immunity function, which I think is critically important. Now, this hit home to me very personally in June of 2009, when my 84-year-old mother called me up and said, Paul, I have something very serious to talk to you about, but you're always so busy. It's a terrible thing for, to hear from mom. I said, mom, what's wrong? And she's a very happy, genuine person. She goes, I'm worried. And my mother's deeply religious, has not seen a doctor since 1968. She said, my right breast is five times the size of my left. I have six swollen lymph glands the size of walnuts. And her voice started shaking, and I'm not ashamed to admit that I started crying. Why didn't you tell me sooner? We spent a large part of June at the Swedish Breast Cancer Clinic in Seattle. The oncologist examined her, and upon the second examination, she had a 5.5 centimeter diameter tumor. It metastasized, it went to her sternum, it went to her liver. She had stage four breast cancer. The doctor gave her less than three months to live and stated it was the second worst case of breast cancer she has seen as a doctor in 20 years of practice. We had the circle family meeting. Many of you have gone through this. My mom announced that she bought a pine casket, the cheapest one that she could find, because she was going to heaven. But then the doctor said, you know, you're too old to have radiation therapy. You can't have your breasts removed. 
But there's an interesting study on turkey tail mushrooms at Bistir Medical School. You might want to try taking those. And that's, my mother goes, well, my son's supplying those. So she was put on Taxol and Herceptin, wonderful drugs. And then she started taking eight turkey tail capsules a day, four in the morning and four in the evening. And that was in June of 2009. And today, my mother has no detectable tumors. And I'd like to bring my mother home. <laughs>